Welcome um, to this session and thank you for being here. Um, this is the uh, open source strategy room and essentially what we will talk about, uh, the topic is bring your product manager to the open source dance. And essentially what we are saying is often in companies, uh, open source decisions seem to be made by engineers or technical teams um, in terms of what to consume, whether to contribute back, uh, whether to fork, whether to uh, release something. Um, and of course, legal is involved. But often the general managers of businesses or product managers who are making product decisions are often not involved. Because either they think it's a technical decision and that business does not need to be involved, or uh, the engineering teams just don't, you know, make time to in involve the business side. So our discussion today is to say uh, open source is very much a business strategy, very much needs to be aligned with the business of the company, and we need to involve our business side in investing in open source, in decisions about whether to release or not, uh, in uh, how we work with upstream, how we message to the market. So we want to make sure that we uh, run open source as a business strategy and critical to the business strategy of the company because most of our companies uh, are using upwards of 70, 80% of our software is open source. So we develop dependencies and it's important to our business continuity, but it's also important to our success in innovation. So with that description, I want to uh, do a couple of things. One, I want to introduce myself and then ask my panel to introduce themselves. Um, my name is Nithya Ruff, and I run the open source program office at Amazon. Uh, so we support all of the developers across Amazon, uh, both AWS as well as the devices, Store, Prime, Whole Foods, uh, the, the whole breadth of the business. And as you can see, there are lots of different use cases. There are a lot of different ways we use open source. We use a lot of open source across the company. And uh, our customers also require and want us to use open source, work with open source. And uh, we also believe that as part of the global open source ecosystem, we should um, give back, sustain open source, uh, be involved uh, from make, making sure open source is successful. Um, to my right is Mary Wang. Okay. Um, thank you to join our panel here. And uh, I am Mary Wang, Director of Open Source Ecosystem for Volvo Cars. So, <clears throat> I think everyone knows Volvo Car, right? And uh, now, our newly released SUV family SUV EX90, the electrical SUV, is on the way to our dealers in Europe and the USA. And in the end of this month, it will arrive to our customer's hand. Unfortunately, I'm not that type of customer because I don't have money <laughs> to buy that expensive, good quality, fast and quiet electric cars. Thank you for Nisia to invite me for this uh, panel and I have the opportunity to share our thoughts for how our OSPO works and how we bring product management to this open source stage. Thank you. To George, please. Yeah, hello everybody. My name is Georg Kunz. I'm uh, with Ericsson, a member of the uh, Ericsson Open Source Program Office. Um, well, maybe I should also say, uh, Ericsson, you may or may not know, is uh, a telco uh, equipment and software provider, right? So the, the operators of this world, they run, among others, <laughs> of course, Ericsson hard and software to make mobile and fixed networks work. Um, we have established an OSPO around about three years ago, and this is also when I joined our OSPO. Um, I've been with Ericsson for about 11 years now and along that entire time have been in various roles that always have been a, or had a strong relationship to open source software. I started out as a developer um, 
working on our OpenStack-based product and then quickly transitioning into other tech-related open source projects. So, yeah, and, and now I'm, I'm really happy to be a part of the OSPO and uh, can take an active role in making Ericsson an even better open source company than it is today. Um, yeah, happy to be on the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Alex Scammon. I run the uh, OSPO for G Research, which is a quantitative research firm, which essentially means we use AI and ML to uh, predict movements in markets and then make money out of money in, in the financial world. So uh, what I do for them is run the OSPO, and we started the OSPO about six years ago. Uh, and we're a little unusual, not completely unusual, but a little unusual in that we uh, have about 30 to 40 actual engineers on the team who contribute directly to open source uh, projects that aren't ours, that are just upstream contributions, philanthropic contributions. Um, and uh, we'll get more into that later, but uh, in, in light of this panel, you can imagine that if I have 30 or 40 engineers, we have to be very in line with our business partners. And we're gonna talk more about exactly that. So. Yes, thank you, Alex. Um, I am really happy that we have three very different OSPOs and OSPOs don't always look the same. So OSPO is Open Source Program Office and it was set up inside companies to help the company navigate open source, you know, uh, have a policy process uh, with regards to compliance, with regards to working with upstream, downstream, and to make it more uh, coordinated and standardized, if you will, across the company. Otherwise, imagine um, all the thousands of developers in a company will all go off and do their own thing, and not always safely, uh, and may violate certain compliance rules, uh, may not always uh, you know, use their company email, and so on and so forth. So OSPOS really came into being in the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, to make sure that there's a strategy behind how companies work with open source. So one of my questions is going to be, because we have three very different OSPOs, four different OSPOs, right, including myself, um, my question is, how have you organized your OSPO to support your business goals? How have you aligned it to support your business goals? Alex, since you have the mic, and I think you're doing something unique. Yeah, I mean, as I say, we have a whole bunch of engineers on my team who are contributing. And because of that, we have to work very closely with the engineering teams that we're supporting. We're essentially going out and working on all the AI ML tools of the day. They're all open source, right? So it's PyTorch and TensorFlow and Horovod and Arrow and Pandas and NumPy. And like you go down the list of all the things that we use all the time. It's all open source all the time. And we, our researchers, will run into issues and bugs and need features and new capacities of these tools. My team is deputized to go out and work with the community to make those things happen. Those things happen, G Research can take those new tools and make more money out of them. With more money, they give me a little chunk of it, and then I can go and do more work, and uh, the, the open source tools and, and the world get better. Um, that's the sort of basic premise. To understand what we, uh, what we, well, you were asking about organization first and foremost. Um, so the, the business itself is broken up into loosely two big areas. There's research, which is actually working on the models and coming up with a very clever mathematical ideas of how we're gonna make money on the markets. Uh, and then there's the huge engineering effort to support those very clever people at, in research. Uh, and my organization is divided more or less into that same grouping. There's a, a group which will work with research, and there's a group that will work with engineering infrastructure. Uh, and then there's a third component to my team, which is uh, the DevRel team, which has a sort of interesting take on DevRel for us. Uh, whereas a lot of other DevRel teams might be about marketing and engaging with customers, we don't actually have customers like a, a normal company. And so ours is all about engaging community and, and actually interacting uh, genuinely with uh, the, those communities that we, that we work with. Um, and it's also about raising the company profile because I bet 
most of you haven't heard of G Research, and that was sort of by design. We were very secretive for the first however long, 15 years of our existence. And so um, those are the three components of, of our OSPO. Uh, do you want me to go into taking that organization and then working with it, or should we just describe? Just that's, that's good, and, and we'll then get to other questions that will get deeper. Um, it's quite unusual what Alex's organization does, because most OSPOs uh, tend to be very compliance focused, making sure they're working with legal, uh, making sure when we contribute something it's done correctly, when we distribute something it's done correctly, when we consume, we know which licenses we are consuming and things of that nature. Um, and the maintainers sometimes, for instance, at Amazon sit with the business. So because they know what the business dependencies are on upstream and what changes they need to make, so they sit with the business, whereas in the case of G, uh, G Stream? G Research. G Research, thank you. G Streamer is another <laughs> company. Uh, G Research, it, they sit there. Uh, so that's quite unusual. Uh, Georg, how, how is Ericsson organized? I know you have a number of different groups. Yes, um, but our OSPO primarily is um, a very traditional one then in comparison because we have we are a fairly small team that uh, in terms of mandate uh, has a fairly classic scope um, for OSPO. So we we own and oversee the processes regarding how the company is supposed to work with open source software. That means the consumption and the contribution processes, as you mentioned. Um, but we also look into providing training material and of course having um, conversations with business owners about like the business stuff. Um, the um, so we do not necessarily contribute. We, we don't have a strong contribution uh, capability in the OSPO itself. That is more like an attached function and or we try to um, basically push this obviously out across the entire company so that product organizations, well, if, if they need to fix the bug, um, ideally they do it themselves. Um, the Maybe the telco specific aspect here is that our OSPO is hosted in, on the group level of Ericsson in the CTO office and within the CTO office in the standardization organization. So uh, standardization is fairly important in the telco industry, uh, fairly traditional and a strong focus on that. And um, for us, it basically, we, we had a choice to either put it in a more like a development focused organization or into the standardization organization, but placing it in standardization basically highlights the, the importance of open source software and its standardization potential um, by, again, having the OSPO in that organization. So um, that's, yeah, that's how we approach this. And um, yeah. You, you bring up an interesting point because open source establishes default standards or de facto standards. So it's a different way to standardize. Uh, through open source, yeah. And more traditional in, in other OSPOs is to work in either engineering or the CTO office and to kind of provide guidance uh, across the company. So that sounds like a pretty traditional uh, organization. Uh, I, I'll explain more what we do. Mary, how is Volvo organized to support the business? Yeah, it's a very interesting question, you know, no matter what Nisi asks us, you will always get three different answers. Yes. And all of them are correct because all of that is our experience and practice in our own company. So how is our Osborne works? Uh, our Osborne has formed like in two years, so it's still kind of a quite young compared to other Osborne's. But because of we stand on the giant shoulder like Amazon, Ericsson or others, so we learn very fast. So if you're familiar with the maturity mode of the open source one, two, three, four, five, so we are pr probably like doing this one, two, three, or four at the same time. So we're doing the compliance and contribution and the collaboration at the same time. For the business strategy, I would say the first step is like to force the open source culture in the automotive industry is very important. So make people know this area and work together with a software strategy, which like buy, make, share. So people don't like just close their door and making their, uh, write their code for the feature itself. So they need to know about the open source, just 
open source open their mind. So that's very important. Um, for this Osborne itself, it's very similar to Ericsson's, I would say, from the size aspects. So we have a small Osborne, four people, and which focus on different areas. Yeah. Thank you. That, that makes sense. Um, so at Amazon also, uh, I, I talk about it as we have a broad open source program. And uh, one aspect of it is uh, open source compliance and working with engineering on processes and standardization, which is what my team does. And then our partner team, one of my colleagues is here, they do a lot of the outbound uh, strategy from a, a open source perspective. You know, which communities do we participate in? Which uh, events do we sponsor? You know, how do we communicate what we do in open source to the outside world? How do we fund? and sustain you know, some of the open source uh, organizations we depend upon. And then across the business is uh, the maintainers who actually do the work uh, and they contribute to their own communities. For example, the managed uh, Kubernetes community, EKS, they will do all of the upstream work with Kubernetes, with CNCF, with ContainerD, et cetera. My colleague Phil is here, uh, and that's what they do. And then the MariaDB team and uh, the uh, Postgres team will work with the Postgres open source community, so all the maintainers kind of sit there. And essentially, from a business strategy perspective, like all of us, we all have to understand what type of business is my company in. And for us, the AWS business is different. The devices business is different. So I have to say, for AWS, what is it that matters? You know, how do we create the right policy, the right license process, the right go-to-market, you know, for them? Uh, in, in the case of AWS, there's a lot of contribution back. There's working with upstream. Our customers expect us to do open source. So there's a lot more visible engagement. On the devices side, it's more consumers don't care what's under the wraps but they, we use it and uh, they don't do as much upstream. They're more interested in making sure that they are following all the compliance rules from a distribution perspective. So it's, it's different, I suppose, but you have to remember, what is my company's business? How are we using open source? So hence, what shape should my organization be? And what policies and processes do I need to have to get that done? So, um, I wanted to kind of come back to you, Mary, uh, and see how do you work with the business side of your company, you know, your product managers, your global, uh, your GMs and, you know, business decision makers. Do you actually work with them closely? Yes, definitely. Yeah. It's, um, it happens before we form an Osborne because it's like before you form an Osborne, from here, how you convince all these managers up to not CEO, but the chief level to form the OSPO. So you work a lot with the managers, different levels manager line. So it's a tough journey. It takes us like more than half a year to form the OSPO. Um, before the form OSPO, I'm driving the open source council. So all of us are volunteers or kind of with our passion to work on this as a side. Um, then you think, oh, now great, we have formed OSPO. Then we do not need to f work with these managers and blah, blah. After half a year, even though we developed a lot of the fundamental stuff, making this pro process, tools, everything simplest, but implementation, who care you? Who are you, right? So still, now we are kind of pick it up again to doing this open source short video, like three minutes video with all of this uh, head of engineering R&D together, push to all the white employees email box, mandatory course. And also we have this open source training for leadership, not only for engineers, but also for leadership. So leadership includes not only managers, but also like product managers, POs, or uh, solution, uh, we call it solution are different levels leader. So that's very important and it will be up and running for like half an year, more than half a year. So I think without involving the managers or product managers or engineers managers, it's very difficult to make the work really done. Yeah. You need the support so that the developers will have time to do 
the contributions they need to make or uh, yes. follow policy. Yeah. Yes. So because, you know, we produce cars, all of this is deadline, 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 right? So developers don't have that much time or capacity to do both compliance and contribution. So how to kind of give them this, um, the manager support and then you know how much time this developer needs and also how to reduce the time if they work with open source. For example, we also from the business aspects, we joined the Covisa um, Foundation this year, the April, April of this year, and we're working with this software defined vehicle as well. So hopefully we will can work involved more and more in this uh, community. Yeah. Makes sense. George, how do you guys work with, I mean, sponsorship, getting sponsorship is important in the beginning, but then on an ongoing basis, how do you stay in touch with the business? Yeah, yeah. so obviously it is fundamentally important across the company, across product managers and uh, line managers to have a proper understanding of well, how to work with open source correctly, kind of. Um, I have to admit there's, of course, the tendency to just grab open source software from the shelves of the internet and then because it solves a technical problem short term, um, but lacking a mid to long term perspective on what it means in terms of cost and in terms of capabilities and investment really. And it's about the investment piece that needs to be communicated. So um, this is where the, the managers, line managers and, and product managers come in um, to make sure that we that, that they take the right business decision, starting at like picking the right components, obviously, if they have want to have a say in this, but primarily doing the right budgeting, um, resource planning, so that, well, organizations are actually enabled and capable of yeah, maintaining or supporting the, the key open source components that end up being part of a product. Um, enabling developers to, well, contribute upstream. And all of this is, well, I would say understood probably very well in this room here. Um, internally, it's still, let's say we are on a journey and it's a fairly large organization too. Like within Ericsson, of course, there are organizations that have been working a lot with open source for years already and other parts more on the embedded side, obviously less. So there's even a gradient across the company and kind of making sure that we have a common perspective and position on this, I think is important. So we have recently started to um, condense, working on condensing down what our position and core strategy with respect to open source really is on a company level. Uh, again, so work in progress, but this will be the foundation for, um, let's say, additional uh, let's say, work with the respective business organizations and product organizations to maybe refine this for their particular um, local use cases. But uh, similar as what Mary said, this, this high-level buy-in and communication of set strategy is um, fundamentally important. And yeah, we are on a journey to kind of push this out across, um, across the company. Yeah. Well said. You know, sometimes we assume that it's zero cost because we can just download it. I love the way you said it from the shelves of the internet mm -hmm. and that there is no cost, but there actually is a cost of ownership. And you do need to invest in knowledge, in working with upstream and patching and uh, advancing and sustaining, you know, the open source. And that needs to be built into the budget if you take a dependency on a software that you just downloaded. Yep, well said. Alex, how, how does that work for you? I really want to talk about the investing back into yes. contributions, but um, uh, the, the initial question was... Uh, how do you work with your business side of the house? Um, yeah, I mean, there's... Um, fundamentally, we think of ourselves as a service organization, and so we go to the engineers and the engineering teams um, who may be suffering uh, some problem with some open source uh, tool that we that we're using, and and work to serve their needs. That's sort of primarily where we get our um, the work that we're going to work on. Uh, the other direction, of course, is from the top, and we work within the architecture uh, team at G Research. And so we're 
making sure that these things that we're hearing from the bottom up are actually aligning with our strategic direction, uh, making sure that we're not going down some rabbit hole for two years worth of open source work only to find out that that was never the plan to go with that tool in the first place. So, um, you know, aligning those things, normal corporate speak, alignment and yes. things like that. Um, but then the last piece that we've been working hard over the last couple of years, but from the beginning, has been working very closely with our finance department to actually model out how much money we are making or saving for the company in terms of dollars that the finance team themselves talk about to the board. And over the last year or two, we've, we've gotten to that point where the numbers are ratified by our finance department. So if anyone from the board level goes, what, what the hell are you doing with this open source stuff? We can actually go to them with like, hey, these are, these are the numbers from the models that you guys use to determine the profitability of the entire company. And so it's like a, a very third Im important leg of our, how, we, how we interact with the business. Uh, I, I really, really appreciate what you said in the end, which is how do we quantify what the impact of open source is to your company, right? cost savings, the time to market, uh, the uh, well, we, frankly, revenue opportunity. Yeah, we, we have revenue generating things that we have contributed to like, and that make lots of money for the company, it turns right. out. So. And then the brand reputation improvement for the company and how that then brings in more business or you know, how that enhances our ability to work in the world. Yeah, that, and that gets to the fuzzy end of the spectrum on the money stuff, yeah. so yeah. The, we could talk about the fuzzy bits too. But it's important to do the the hard quantification first, and then the soft quantification yep. later. Yeah, absolutely. I'm hearing you say, I, I I think one of the biggest challenges uh, all of us face is what you all have said, which is, a you need to have a good sponsor, an executive in the team who understands open source and uh, is willing to support you and what you do and the investment needed. The second is we all struggle to get the business to make time to do upstream contributions. Uh, they, they have so much going on, line managers and GMs. They have businesses to support, deadlines to make, as you said, Mary. And so making, carving out time to make open source contributions, that it's important from a technical debt perspective or from a reputation perspective or trust building or making sure that you're aligned with the upstream open source roadmap is very difficult. So you have to constantly work at that, all of us do. The third one is uh, what George said, this very inconsistent um, you know, understanding of open source usually across the company. So how do you get everybody uh, you know, agreeing to a set of principles, if you will, on how we will approach open source? but yet kind of uh, customize it for their particular business. So in our case, devices uh, has a very different way to approach open source and should, as opposed to say the EKS business, which is elastic Kubernetes. Um, so we have to uh, create both the balance between standardization and allowing them to work locally and measuring the impact. I think that's so important. We are at 11.27, so I'd like to go to the audience and uh, see if they have any questions. Um, yes? Yeah, just... I'll repeat the question, yeah. I can, I can, yeah, I can talk about everything. Um, very curious about how you got financial analysis on your open source contributions. Can you go into more detail about that? Could you yep. open source your... <laughs> <laughs> Yes, the, the question was when we're going to open source the, uh, uh, the, the framework for figuring out how much money we're making the company. And um, so the, there was a spectrum I was sort of alluding to it earlier. The fuzzy end of the spectrum is what I was talking to. Um, we were talking about um, like hiring and talent retention or uh, the company's profile, that kind of a thing. But there's for us a very, very uh, tangible and direct end of the spectrum, which is uh, all start to, started with cost savings. There were a whole bunch of um, tools that we were using that were proprietary tools that weren't actually useful for us, that were, that were costing us money, that were mm, holding us back, uh, but that we were beholden to that we got 
out from under uh, having to pay them because there were all open source alternatives that my team was able to contribute meaningful features to that allowed us to start using these things. In one case, um, a tool for uh, compiling .NET code to GPUs. Um, they didn't want to go to .NET Core, which was not going to allow us to use millions of dollars worth of GPUs that we had just bought from NVIDIA. And we went on and worked with an open source project to add all the features that we needed to that thing and were able to drop the uh, the proprietary things. They weren't interested in, in upgrading to this thing. We were stuck. Um, and in that case, it's a very clear uh, a case of like, we saved hundreds of thousands of pounds a year and got to use this thing that now we can improve and have made miles better than what we had in, in, in the beginning. And so we're even making more money. But like, it's a very, very hard, tangible thing that like, all right, we just saved half a million pounds or whatever every year for the next however many years forward. And then you go to sort of down the line of um, from really hard tangibility to that fuzzy end of the spectrum. There's, uh, there are other projects that we have done that have materially impacted revenue generating projects. Now, we didn't do the whole project, but the ability to do that project was only, uh, only capable because we, we created some open source tool. And so we'll take some percentage of that, take a conservative number, um, conservative percentage, and you know, we work with finance to figure out, and we work with the teams to figure out how much of a percentage we should get with uh, out of that. And then the further down the spectrum, there's like uh, developer productivity. If we have increased build times by 10x, which we have in some cases, that's, you know, how many builds per month, per day is a developer doing? How many uh, builds is, a, is our CI running? Uh, you can calculate that. And so we go down the line as far as we can uh, for those numbers, for the, uh, the things that we can actually calculate. And it turns out that when we started doing all those things, started adding up all the things that we could easily get at with finance, we didn't need to go down to the fuzzy end of the spectrum at all. It turns out that we are, uh, I think, paying for ourselves three times over just with that stuff. And we're, we're maybe about, I don't know, 60% of the way through our work with finance there. So there's yet more money that we could probably assert that we we make for the company but we're we've done enough at this point yeah so. yeah hopefully we'll, we'll like triple by the end of the year no uh -huh. george and mary any anything to add to it i think the cost savings is an easy one right because especially if you're replacing a service contract with a proprietary vendor with in-house but you still have to allow for some maintenance costs and stuff but the revenue one is hard right and you've got to get some agreement with your finance guys. Uh, and then the productivity is hard. Uh, so, but, but I love the, the cost savings one. How, are you guys doing anything, any measurement like that? Well, <laughs> I wish we had more concrete data. Um, it would be really helpful uh, to facilitate <laughs> discussions we have across the company. But it seems that we are kind of here in, in agreement that it's really hard to, yeah. to get um, good data. Um, and of course, there is, again, a very broad spectrum ranging from like what's challenging for us at times is technical debt, getting rid of those, um, you know, local changes, local forks, taking a more upstream focused approach. You could look into how much time does an organization spend on maintaining, you know, local fixes instead of pushing them upstream, these mm -hmm. sorts of things. Um, then I think we, in the prep, we also talked about customer aspects and that of course gets way more challenging in our case customers do of course are interested in what we're doing in, in open source um, there are plenty of uh, telco open source focused projects customers do ask in their purchase processes for our let's say what how we approach open source how much we're contributing and kind of the effect of this onto a customer's purchase decision is of course it's like obviously it's it's there but it's really hard for us to quantify at least for me right now um but it's kind of obvious that well if you, you're not active then it's it worse right? <laughs> yeah. right so this on that level it's kind of obvious and easy but coming up with hard numbers is obviously way more yeah. challenging yeah i agree 
I, I don't know if you had anything to add to that, Mary. Uh, let, let's, yeah. Let's. It's a really good question. I think mostly all the companies have this type of a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, I will talk about from three aspects. The first one is like save money. Some we in Volvocar we use this DDT. It's called data driven transparency. So if you don't have enough data to convince these managers, it's very difficult to continue with your um, dream. Uh, but from the open source aspects, from your the legal when they do the MAA, and for the purchasing, it's quite easy and uh, to see it directly. But for this joint open source foundations or projects, it's because this is an investment, it can be failed too. So no one can guarantee this must be a success. And from the principle, oh, it's good. But from the reality, you can just throw the money into this ocean, so nothing back. So that's why it's very important, Alex, talk about how they do it in there internally and uh, use their model and to analyze. I would like from you. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think one of the key learnings for me is become a partner with your finance person and then work on how do we, what is an acceptable form of measurement in our company so that we can explain it to uh, our leadership and in our business reviews, et cetera. I'll say one last thing. Um, we, from a business continuity perspective at Amazon, we'll say to the business, um, your business continuity can be impacted if you are not involved in your upstream project. What if it goes away or it does not succeed? then your business that's built on that will also not succeed. So at least from a risk management, business continuity management, you need to invest in that. So that's one of the business languages we've used, but there's, there was another question there. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I kind of want to bring the question of the measurement to maybe the top line a little bit. Um, I guess one thing which a lot of companies are doing open source for is for the branding. So because brand recognition theoretically can be used to a, save your marketing cost when you're actually shipping a product. B, as Alex mentioned, some of the fuzzy ones. But in fact, I mean, like, some of those are actually measurable. So for instance, I mean, like, how much uh, money you, uh, it costs you to hire a, a solid engineer. Mm -hmm. That's actually calculable. Yep. Um, that said, the difficulty of using the top-line measurements, especially branding, is having a heuristic agreement or consensus mm -hmm. on the value of the branding can be hard. Uh, so for instance, upsell from a CE version to the uh, you know, enterprise version, how much money do I actually save for the company? In order to do that, it's kind of like not really uh, easily calculable. So I would like to maybe just um, see how from the panelists. I'm, I'm working as an um, for, for AMP Group, which is a data company. Uh, so we're experiencing the same pain. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeking the wisdom from the audience in terms of um, from the panelists to see if there are actually good measurements for branding uh, I, I'm curious if anyone from the Chaos Group is here. There's, there's actually a subgroup in the Linux Foundation called the Chaos Group, which does measurements both on community health and OSPO measurements and things like that. But um, I think it's, it's really, to your point, coming up with a heuristic, either a survey uh, of your customers which says how much does it matter to them uh, that you have an open source reputation, you're working with open source, that uh, you engage with open source, all that good stuff, and then use those numbers to say it matters to our customers that we are involved in open source. In fact, it is a part of their decision-making process to work with us. So maybe some sort of a tangible, quantifiable data there could be used to measure you know, how important it is. Uh, to the top line. And then with recruitment also to say, um, you know, to put a question in the recruitment saying, did this engineer join us because of our open source work and reputation and being visible in the community? Uh, was that part of that decision making process? Right? And so really inserting ourselves into brand and into, uh, into the recruitment and stuff. But any, any other thoughts? I don't say that, that you work for a fintech, is that what you're saying? Um, if your fintech hasn't thought about how they apportion money, I'd be very surprised. <clears throat> your, your finance team 
probably does have some formula for why they're spending however much they do on marketing. And you may be forcing the issue to some degree to, to like get them to explain their thinking and their rationale, but there should be some model, some way for you to, to tap in and say, like, how do you value this? Yeah. And then, uh, you know, they, there may be some heuristic that is still fuzzy to, to try and get it how much you're improving that value. But, um, but that's, that's sort of where we started, just by asking them how they do, how they think holistically about the money they spend on the business. That's the place to start, generally. That's a great point. I mean, really sitting down with finance and becoming best friends with finance and saying, you know, what percentage of revenue is allocated to go to market or sales? And of that, how much is, you know, given to advertising, branding, et cetera. And this is a part of that and, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, we have about two minutes left. Yes. The question was, how do you get everybody on the same page with regards to policies and processes? Yeah, because I, I just looked up, and I think the latest one is at 100,000 returns. Mm -hmm. It's really over that, but I, I think that I'm very focused on the very Yeah, well, I, I, <laughs> it's a journey, as the managers would say. So, of course, we do have official steering documents, right? Like uh, documents describing what um, the what you should do in terms of product engineering, security, these sorts of things, and also like the, the processes when using open source software. Then the question is, how do you kind of distribute that understanding across the company? We have recently been, or, and still are working on putting training material together, right? And we are going to slowly roll this out across the entire company. Of course, we like, can't and don't want to do it like entirely uh, or to the entire company in one sweep because most likely we'll get feedback we'll learn from, <laughs> from this and we need to incorporate it back. But with a large R&D organization, we have about 30,000 engineers, I think. Um, well, you, you also want to make sure that the training is good so because it takes a lot of time and that costs money uh, if you kind of push out not helpful material then again we do have um, when it on the on the consumption side we do have uh, on the product side a network of um, people just focusing on the configuration management what do the product structures look like they look at the licensing aspects and so on so there is like a distributed approach to it and it would be ideal if we um, what we have is like we, we are working in we have set up a steering organization with multiple representatives from those but we really depend on this network of um, yeah configuration managers to push down the the understanding into the organizations like how to go about using open source software and we need to establish the same or I'd like to really establish the same on the co contribution side too um, to basically have this community of practice that scales across the company because scale is the, the biggest issue really here and this is how we'd like to approach this. Yeah, it's a challenge. We are out of time. Uh, I Just to summarize it's absolutely important to stay in touch with your business side. Know the business of your company, how open source plays a role there, how to support it. Make friends with your finance person. <laughs> Understand uh, what the metrics are of measurement in your company, how to measure open source and its impact, uh, so that we continue to invest and fund and do the right things in open source. And then the last question around consistency, scaling across the company through champions, through uh, community of practice, through policies, process, training, as Mary also said. Yeah. So when, uh, follow up, uh, an in the Bureau, yes. Yes. And, and a similar invitation, like we're all on the, on the to-do group Slack, everyone here. Uh, I love talking about this rubbish. If you have questions, particularly about the, the finance side of things, like hit me up.
Yes, so just to reconfirm, to do group, um, Europe is very active. Inner Source Commons, I see my friend there. Um, they do a lot of work on how do you do better practices inside the company, use open source inside the company, and share across the company. So those are two really good, good resources, I would say, uh, to follow up on some of these things and also to hit up the panel. Thank you all for really being here and uh, helping us have a good discussion.